Cooperative Extension, and I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to the second in our Food and Community series of panel discussions. Uh, the series is sponsored by the Psychology and Community Studies Program at the University of Maine Machias, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, and the Libra Foundation. Uh, the series is connected to a sociology course taught by Megan Duff here at the University of Maine at Machias. And Megan, uh, oh, there you are. This, this is Megan. And uh, you have anything to say? Uh, I guess what I would like to say is thank you for coming. Um, food and food systems topics are really exciting because they're really complex and all of us have to eat. So, And thank you for community members who actually provided the input which generated the topics for our panels. So. And thank you, panelists, for being here. Thank you. Um, the next in the series will focus on the Washington County food system, and the panelists will include representatives from uh, the Machias Hannaford, uh, Machias Marketplace Buying Club, Tide Mill Farm, and a natural resource economics faculty member from UMaine Machias, and that will be December 11th. Um, I want to ask you to please turn off your cell phones. This is a housekeeping thing. <laughs> I, I uh, just turned mine off. Um, there are bathrooms down this hallway, as well as out through these doors to the left. And if those are busy, there's even more uh, upstairs. Uh, in groups, sometimes people feel more comfortable writing their questions as opposed to asking them publicly. And so we have uh, cards. I don't know if anybody picked any, but any up, but we have uh, index cards and pencils uh, for you to write questions that you may have for the panelists. And we will uh, present uh, as many of those as we can in the second half of the event. And um, um, let's see, we understand that many people are quite passionate about this topic and differences of opinion are natural. And I uh, just request that we all uh, be respectful of one another, even if our opinions may differ. And um, for the first part of the discussion, what we're going to do is each panelist will have seven minutes to give a brief overview of what, their, uh, what they would like to say in, in reference to their area of expertise. <coughs> And what I will do is uh, signal you uh, when you have about one minute left. And um, so let's start first with um, Eric Jones. Eric Jones is an assistant professor of plant biology at the University of Maine Machias. His interests are biodiversity, botany, and the philosophy of biology, which I thought was quite interesting. Eric is the curator of University of Maine Machias's herbarium, which houses collections of plants and marine macroalgae. And um, he's going to also, in, in, as part of his overview, talk a little bit just about what we mean by GMO, uh, what we mean by genetically modified foods, what the words transgenic means, and perhaps give a brief layman's description of how that's done. So, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Well, uh, thank you all for being here. Can everybody hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got my lecture voice on, just got out of that. Um, so, uh, my name's Eric Jones, um, and I'd like to just uh, start off by saying my interest in being here is, is one, you know, is a being, I'm thankful for being asked to be a part of this panel. Um, I don't have in depth uh, expert. Uh, background with GMOs in particular, but being a plant biologist and having studied plant biology from the molecular end to the ecological end of things, um, I'm happy to offer my own opinion on, on these things and what I've learned. Um, so I guess starting with what a GMO is, when we're talking about genetically modified organisms, um, this is a term it's kind of loaded in a way, actually, uh, because all of the traditional vegetables that you eat, the tomatoes, the broccoli, everything that you're used to eating and growing in the traditional fashion are genetically modified organisms. That is, they've been selectively bred to produce the types of things that we like. Uh, if you want to take an extreme example of that, we've got 
uh, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, cauliflower, um, all bred from the same species of field mustard. So we've been genetically modifying organisms since, well, the dawn of agriculture. What we're talking about, I think, more specifically in this particular panel is, has been termed by some uh, entities like the Ecological Society of America as genetically engineered organisms. That is, instead of selectively breeding the type of plant or fish or fowl that we're interested in getting through the process of uh, natural selection and uh, sexual reproduction, what we're able to do at this point is actually take genes and or engineer genes that confer specific traits things that we're interested in having, more milk, bigger tomatoes, frost resistance, resistance to insect pests, and literally stick those into the genomes of the organisms that we're raising. It has great potential, I think, uh, to help people, but like all tools that we've developed over the course of human history, it can be misused as well. And I think that's probably the crux of the matter that we're gonna come to. Um, over the course of the discussion is the use of these um, in particular because they're <coughs> generally owned, and correct me if I'm wrong on this one, owned literally by corporations that develop them and that causes some necessary complications. Um, so trying to lay the groundwork for that one. Um, so are we all in agreement on that. <laughs> so what we're talking about are organisms that are been modified in a very particular way. Um, and I think to get it, the other definitions you were talking about, uh, Alan, were transgenic. Yeah. Um, so one of the one of the interesting things about this technology is that where you could take traits from one variety of corn and breed it with another variety of corn to come up with a variety of corn that has the best of both worlds. Now we're able to actually take genes from organisms that aren't even in the same kingdom and actually bring them together into one genome. So if there's a gene that confers frost resistance that's say found in a fish, we're able to actually integrate that into the genome of a plant, a plant that we would like to be frost resistant. So we're able to break down species barriers with this technology that we were previously unable to even begin to get at. And that really just begins to scratch the surface if we think about the ability to engineer genes, that is to put together a gene base by base to build it the way that we want it and then introduce it into organisms. Um, my own experience with this has to do obviously with plants being a botanist. And the wonderful thing about plants is that you can take the plant, part of the plant tissue, and actually treat it with chemicals that, that make those cells what we call pluripotent, that is to turn it into a massive plant tissue that's not differentiated into any types of organs, roots, stems, leaves, fruits, flowers. And in that stage, be able to introduce using what we call a vector, usually a bacterium, that carries the gene we're interested in into the tissue of that plant. You treat it with another chemical and it will begin to produce roots, stems, eventually leaves, flowers, and then the fruit that we're interested in usually. Um, so they're very, they're very amenable to this type of manipulation. Um, I guess the only other thing I would add is um, there's definitely a distinction, I think, to be made between the tool and how it's actually used. And, um, so I think that's definitely worth our consideration this evening. Well, thank you. Thank you. So um, next I, I'd like to introduce Jim Gerritsen. Jim and his wife Megan have owned and operated Wood Prairie Farm in Bridgewater, Maine in Aristic County for over 35 years. In addition to uh, being president of the Organic Seed Growers and Trade Association. Jim was on the certification committee of the Maine Organic Farmers and Growers Association for over 20 years and has been active in many other organizations that promote organic farming. And um, for, for all of these uh, panelists, uh, there are more complete bios on the, the table from when you by the door where you entered if you're interested in knowing more about them. So 
Jim, I'll turn it over to you to uh, tell us what, what you have on it. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, what we do in Aroosa County, we raise organic seed, and what will not come as a surprise to, anyway, uh, to anyone here is that seed potatoes is our main crop. Aroosa County and uh, potatoes have, gone, have a history going back 200 years. Uh, we have one of the best uh, soils and climates for raising potatoes anywhere in the world, and uh, we have the ability to raise some of the highest quality seed potatoes anywhere, certainly anywhere in North America. That's how we make our living. My involvement uh, in the organic community comes from the fact that we've been involved in organic for almost 40 years, and it's what provides our livelihood, and we feel that uh, it's proper to be involved and develop your community, and in this case, protect our community. And there are two issues that I, I want to speak about tonight. Um, uh, one that you maybe have heard about, there was a lot of coverage of the GMO labeling bill here in Maine. Uh, it was called LD-718, and it was a um, primary initiative of Maine Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association, which is the organic uh, group in Maine that we've been active with uh, for over 35 years, and we we're actually certified organic by uh, MOFCA. So this became uh, a top priority for MOFCA to get GMO labeling passed in Maine. Uh, we <coughs> worked with two um, legislators, uh, a representative Lance Harville from Farmington, a, a Tea Party Republican, and we had a senator from Lincoln County, um, uh, Chris Johnson, a liberal Democrat. So from the outset, we tried to create a coalition between Republicans and Democrats to craft what we thought was something that the state of Maine needs, and it would require the labeling of any product that originates from a genetically engineered organism. Um, so we um, uh, introduced this uh, bill in the legislature in January, uh, worked it through. Uh, it had extraordinary support uh, from the outset. We had 123 co-sponsors for this bill, and in the entire legislature, there are only 186 legislators, so we had 123 co-sponsors. Um, sometime in the spring, we had a poll, a scientific poll conducted, and we found that over 90% of Mainers wanted, favored a GMO label bill. So um, we went through uh, the Ag Committee, uh, went to the House uh, floor first and then the Senate, and we came up with an overwhelming support for the, uh, for the GMO food label bill. Uh, and the vote, in fact, it was 141 to 4 in the House, and in the Senate it was 35 to 0. Uh, so it was a, a dramatic vote by uh, historic margins. Um, the bill um, was passed by the legislature in the last days of uh, the legislative session in July. And because of the timing of that, uh, the legislature convened um, or, or, or ended their uh, session, and that allowed Governor LePage uh, quite a length of time. And he opted to um, take the time, uh, and he has promised the legislature that he will sign this bill in January when the legislature reconvenes. And we actually have a written letter to the legislature from the governor promising that he will sign this bill. So we think that this will be good once uh, the bill does take effect and it does have a trigger mechanism in which we need four other states in the Northeast to pass similar legislation before it takes place in Maine. But once it does trigger, kicks in, it'll be 18 months that there will be implementation. And after that, there will be a requirement for any product, primarily processed products. That's what the legislation across the country is aimed at it will have to uh, show on the label that it's been uh, genetically engineered. That's one, one topic. The second thing, as Alan alluded to, I'm president of a national trade uh, group called Organic Seed Growers and Trade, and in March of 2011, we filed a federal lawsuit against the American corporation Monsanto, uh, in which we're doing two things. We're challenging the validity of their transgenic seed patents and we're also seeking court protection for family farmers, American family farmers, under the Declaratory Judgment Act um, to correct the perverse injustice within American patent law. And that is that should a um, 
farmer, through no fault of their own, become contaminated by Monsanto's patented seed. Because of that contamination, the way the law reads, that farmer would be at legal jeopardy for being accused of patent infringement. And um, as we all know, we're in a litigious society, and one can easily, um, uh, going up against the most aggressive patent bully probably in the world, certainly in this country, uh, one could lose their farm simply defending themselves from a claim of uh, patent infringement. In, under U.S. patent law, it doesn't matter how one comes into possession. Uh, if the wind should drift pollen on our farm and it's their patented material, un under the law, we are in violation of their patent rights. The only way that somebody can maintain um, and hold on to another's patented material is if they've signed a licensing agreement. Uh, of the 500,000 people in our plaintiff group, what we have in common is we are not customers of Monsanto. We will not be signing any licensing agreement, nor have we ever. So we have no legal right to possess their material. So if they contaminate us under the law, we are liable for uh, claims of patent infringement. And we have gone to the uh, courts trying to get that, get that protection. So far, the um, essence of our, uh, the, the basis of our case, we have not had the chance to argue it because Monsanto has been throwing stumbling block blocks at us with pre-trial motions um, uh, so far challenging whether the farmers have the right to sue them in court. Um, in June, we had a ruling from the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit in Washington, D.C., and they agreed with us that we did have standing, but they offered us protection, which I believe they thought was sufficient protection, on the whole, it's insufficient protection, but they felt the protection that they offered us mooted the case and it re removed the substantial controversy necessary for someone to have standing for the case to go forward. We, we were grateful that they uh, agreed with us that we do have a right to sue, but we disagreed that the um, amount of protection that they provided to the farmers, it's inadequate to protect us. So we have filed in September, we filed an appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court, and we are hoping to hear that they will take our case this winter. That's what we're after. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, next I'd like to, and I, and I apologize in advance for not pronouncing your last name correctly, um, I'd like to introduce Andre Alukin. Close enough. <laughs> um, he's a professor of applied entomology at the University of Maine. He conducts research on applied insect ecology, insect behavior, and integrated pest management. He's a member of the Maine Integrated Pest Management Council and a technical advisor to the Maine Board of Pesticide Control. So, Andre, you've got seven minutes to uh, give a brief overview. Okay, well, hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Before I begin talking, obviously English is not my first language, so if you do not understand anything, please let me know. Do you understand what I'm saying so far? Yes. Good. This is encouraging. So, I'm an entomologist. I work with insects. My PhD dissertation at the University of Maine was actually on insect adaptation to transgenic plants. And I was involved in uh, different regulatory issues um, regarding uh, genetically engineered plants with the Maine Board of Pesticide Control. So before we proceed to further discussions, I wanted to talk a little bit more about what transgenic plants are. Because people who are not agricultural biologists often have this view of a mutant killer tomato, which is lurking over there to suck your brain out. <laughs> and as technologies develop, we might get there. Probably not in the immediate future, but we might. For the time being, however, there are basically three types of genetically engineered plants. One is uh, herbicide-resistant plants. More specifically, glyphosate-resistant plants, and uh, which is Roundup. Uh, well, it's marketed also under other names. Roundup is a common one. 
So what it allows farmers to do is to spray uh, that herbicide on their plants, uh, on, on their weeds once plants got out of uh, the ground. Plants obviously are plants, so herbicides that's supposed to kill plants would most likely kill those plants as well. Herbicides, there is some specificity in them, it's not very high. So if your crop is broadleaf, if herbicide is directed against broadleaf weeds, it will kill your crop, unless it has been genetically engineered to withstand it. So it provides an extra option to um, control weeds chemically later in the season. The second type is uh, plants that uh, are engineered to uh, become toxic to insects. Those are the so-called Bt plants. Bt is a Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a very common bacterium which lives in the soil. And uh, simplistically speaking, this plant is kind of predatory on insects. It would. It produces toxin that would kill insects, and then they will feed on dead insects. So it's not, it's a little bit unusual that the bacterium is not a parasite, but it acts more like a predator. Bacterium is very common. It's pretty much everywhere all over, all over the world in the soils. It has been also for a while used uh, to control insects in organic agriculture. Bacteria are raised in fermentation tanks. Those uh, toxins are harvested and then sprayed on uh, plants. So what has been done, uh, genes that are responsible for producing those toxins, and there are different strains of bacteria which produce different genes. Some of them are active against caterpillars. Some are active against beetles. Some are active against flies, mosquitoes, and so on. So those genes were moved from, um, moved from uh, bacteria into plants. As a result, plants produce those uh, toxins, which are proteins <coughs> in nature. They are toxic to insects. Basically, they make holes in their guts and uh, contents of gut spill inside insect body cavity causing septicemia. They are not having that effect on humans. Our gut structure is very different from insect gut structure, so basically we digest those proteins. And then the third type of uh, transgenic or genetically engineered plants are plants that would have some kind of value-added trait, like maybe they are resistant to cold, maybe they produce uh, some kind of uh, improved uh, starch, maybe they produce some kind of improved dye or whatnot. So those, uh, this is the third type of plants. Currently, uh, the majority of uh, plants, of genetically engineered plants, which are grown commercially, and they are grown over millions and millions of acres worldwide, are either glyphosate-resistant plants, which can be sprayed with herbicides, or uh, insect-resistant plants, which can be, uh, which are not, uh, which are not be. You know, which are not susceptible to caterpillars or to beetles. Many of those plants actually carry both traits, so they are resistant to herbicides, and uh, they also resistant to insects. Hmm? You still have another I still have one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is what, basically this is what we are dealing with when people discuss Ge uh, genetically engineered organisms, whether they say ban G GMO, or whether they say GMO is the way to go in silver bullet and so on, they often lump those three together. And this is where some of the misunderstandings and problems arise. 
they are not the same and we should really discuss them separately. So the issues that might be true for uh, herbicide resistant plants do not necessarily apply to insect protected plants. And those do not necessarily uh, apply to uh, value added trade plants. So uh, I'm sure we will talk about that uh, during our discussion session, but I just wanted to avoid this uh, common but somewhat incorrect situation when we talk about genetic engineered plants as one, you know, uniform entity. All they have in common really is that they have a gene that has been moved from other organisms through molecular genetic techniques. Thank you. Next, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, John Jemison. And uh, John is an extension professor of soil and water quality. And he develops and delivers educational programs to protect surface and groundwater supplies. His agricultural research focuses on nutrient and weed management strategies to improve productivity, reduce risk to water quality, and boost local food production. He's the chair of the Maine Board of Pesticides Control. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be back here. Uh, I think the last time I was here, I was with the Board of Pesticide Control, and we had a listening session to gather concerns from the people in the region. Um, so I've, I have served with them now for about uh, 11 years, and um, and so I have somewhat of a role with this particular issue with them. I also do education for our farm community about these um, traded crops or transgenic crops. I teach students at the university about these, this issue, and I have done research on this issue. So um, I've had Quite, quite a diverse experience with this topic over time. I started in school in 19, starting graduate school in 1985, and that was my first exposure to the kind of tissue that you were just speaking of earlier. And I was, you know, I shared an office with a, a walk by this guy's lab, and I would see that the, what he was working on in there, and and I, I, you know, we had a lot of conversations through the years, and. And I was initially going to, I, was, I studied nitrogen fertilizer efficiency, and, and we would have a lot of conversations that when I, when I became, when I grew up and got a real job, that um, I would probably be looking at how effectively nitrogen fixing corn, transgenically, not, you know, created nitrogen fixing corn would do relative to, say, putting fertilizer nitrogen down. And um, so that was sort of where our, our mentality was in 1985. And, um, you know, and what, what our, our, my colleagues here have, have described to you is, is, is very true. It's very easy to get a plant to produce a protein that might be toxic to a specific insect or a specific class of insects. It's a whole nother animal to get plants to do a lot of complicated things. How to, to get a plant more, more adapted to drought is really difficult. To get a plant to think about, particularly a cereal, to think about fixing nitrogen is incredibly difficult. And we were probably dreaming back in 1985 that that would ever be possible. And, um, and yet, the future that the industry presents to us is that they are going to solve the problems of food and hunger. I was just in Tampa last week at the national meetings, and, and the solution to, uh, to the problems are, are to get these crops into developing nations and get the harvest index up so we can feed everybody, so we can feed nine and a half billion people. Um, so, uh, but the reality is, is if you really get down and do a lot of digging, 
where I come out of in this whole conversation is 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 kind of a gray place. I can sit here and tell you a lot of really good, a lot a lot of specific cases where a transgenic crop could fit a need in somebody's operation to solve a particular problem. And I could tell you in the same breath why I think, you know, putting our, our eggs are in that basket and, and, you know, and running across the field as fast as we can run, we're probably going to break a bunch of eggs. So I think, um, you know, it, it, everybody kind of, I think societally we like black and white issues because they're, they're easy to understand and this is clearly one that is not a black and white issue in my book. One of my biggest complaints with this whole issue is that the companies got it both ways. Like, so if, you, if you're at home and you and your wife and, or you're, you and your spouse are arguing about how much money you're spending and, and you say to your spouse, I really want you to cut back on how much you're, you're spending and then I come home the next day in a nice fa fancy new car you know, I'm probably going to get in trouble, right? And for somehow or another, the industry got the government to say, these things are substantially equivalently the same, and therefore we aren't going to make you do the testing, we're not going to make you do the intensive kind of scrutiny that other places in the world demand of things before they got released. And in the same respect, they can turn around to a farmer and say, if you're going to buy this crop, you have to pay this patent on it because it's different. So how can something be the same and be different? That's been my biggest problem with this whole thing from the start. That being said, um, uh, you know whether or not it's our future is is you know I think as we look down the road, as we look as we move forward, I got to be privileged to listen to a lot of long-term studies that were presented from comparing organic production systems to conventional production systems that have been in place for, for now decades. And for the most part, you know, a well-transitioned organic system can produce a, a great deal of high quality food. And probably the single weakness of the system today is that all of the energy in crop genetics is going to traded crops. And so the long, in the long-term comparisons, they're taking the best genetics. You know, if, if, you're, if your long-term system is, has like corn and soybeans and things like that, you're comparing the corn yield from a, you know, traded high-end genetics compared to something that an organic farmer could, would, would have available, like a Blue River hybrid or one of these kind of traditional, old, older, style, older generation traditional hybrids. And that is another issue that I have, is that by putting all of our, our eggs in that basket, we are dictating, you know, we're saying to the companies, and the companies going out saying, we're gonna solve your pro the world's food problems. We're, we're saying, we're putting a lot of trust in them that they're gonna end up producing what is best for society and, um, and humanity. And, and maybe they will and maybe they won't, but that's my biggest concern uh, looking down the road, but I can. I've done research in this stuff. I've done extension education, and I look forward to the questions that we'll be talking about. Thank you. Uh, so, the the first question that I have, and, and each of you will have the, an opportunity to answer or to pass on it. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify this a little bit based on uh, some comments that, that Andre had, and I'm going to ask. Um, each of you, if, if you would like to discuss some of the benefits, <coughs> risks, or costs of, of um, herbicide resistant, I'm going to break it down into uh, separate categories instead of lumping them all together, of herbicide resistant um, transgenic crops. And um, I guess why don't we uh, start with our herb again? Um, so, question, uh, benefits, costs, risks associated with the uh, so-called Roundup Ready or uh, uh, herbicide-resistant crops. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, 
we should probably lay out the original intentions for developing something like this. And Andre did a wonderful job, I think, explaining that. That the idea is that you know these plants are resistant to herbicides, and so you can plant them, and then you can spray herbicides on your fields, and it will kill the weeds, but it won't kill the plants you're interested in raising, which sounds like a great idea. Um, my general impression of this, uh, from what I do know about the practice and the end results of it, is that what we're starting to see is a number of weed species that are, perhaps not surprisingly, generating resistance to the herbicides that are being used on them. And so the tactic is losing footing, um, at least as I understand it from <laughs> the limited amount of research that's been done on it. Uh, so while there may be great promise for the utility of this, um, tactic for uh, low intensity farming. Perhaps I should back up just a little bit on that. The, I, another aspect of this process and, and part of the impetus for, for doing this in the first place is that the glyphosate, the herbicide that's used, uh, doesn't have as toxic an impact on other organisms in an ecosystem, including the consumers, um, and as I understand it, to some degree, soil organisms as well. Um, so it's a sort of low impact herbicide, but given this system of resistance in the, in the transgenic crops and not in the weeds, um, one would hope that the idea was that it would result in uh, fewer applications of herbicides uh, less frequently over the course of the growing season, which would minimize the amount of herbicide that makes it into the soil. That's the original idea, but it appears that there's bigger holes in that um, than we had originally, or had originally been anticipated. Um, not terribly surprising to me that the weeds would generate some resistance to that over time. We've seen that with pathogens for, well, as long as we've been able to keep track of them. Uh, and so I would say on the whole of the three different types of transgenic crops that we've talked about, I see the least long-term promise for this one uh, in that what it's essentially amounting to, from what I understand, is increased use of herbicides of the same herbicide or going back to traditional methods where your uh, farmers are wanting up having to spray more herbicides on their fields. Um, in this case, personally speaking, I take a more organic approach to that. Um, soil is very important. Nutrient content in soil is very important. These are things that we need to safeguard. They're very hard to replenish. Um, and making soil toxic is all in all, I think a bad idea. But uh, so while there might have been some promise, I think it's run into some snags, and either needs to go back to the drawing board, or somebody needs to come up with a different idea on that one. Thank you, Tim. Do you have anything you'd like to add to that? It's hard to know where to begin. <laughs> um, much as Andre provided some valuable um, uh, explanation, uh, trying to differentiate. Uh, insecticide, bacterial toxin laden, uh, transgenics from uh, Roundup ready from uh, beneficial traits. The reality is that all GMO crops are about control. And you've got to look at this in a historical context. <laughs> Agriculture has been practiced by human beings for 10,000 years. For the first 9,900 of those years, the seed resources was owned by all of us, by our ancestors. Beginning in the late 1800s, seed companies began. Up until that point, the seed was controlled by the farmers. It was selected by the farmers. It was taken, you know, uh, corn, modern corn, originally was a grass. And through selection, through our ancestors, through the common ownership of the people, we develop these into the food crops that we now rely upon, that, that everyone on the planet relies upon. So uh, seed companies came along in the late 1800s and they very quickly got irritated with this pattern of farmers buying seed from them one time and then starting to propagate it out. Well, to my way of looking at seed history, you came up with this idea of hybrids in around 1910, 1915. This was the first step of taking control away from farmers and giving it to an elite seed industry. I believe that 
uh, genetic engineering is the second phase of taking seed away from the heritage. And if you look at that, how fair is that? Our ancestors, for over 9,000 years, developed these food crops, and then Monsanto comes along and does one minor little uh, uh, manipulation and then the government gives them a patent, and a patent is simply a government-recognized monopoly. It allows Monsanto to tell farmers that you can't save seed, you have to come back and buy seed from us every year. I never got a royalty check, you never got a royalty check for the work that our ancestors did for 10,000 years, yet Monsanto is now charging royalty payments for what they call a technology fee. How fair is that? I would submit that genetically engineered crops are all about control. And they come up with, you know, the marketing department comes up with, you know, we had, uh, Maine was one of the first places to grow genetically engineered BT potatoes, which Monsanto called new leaf potatoes. <clears throat> Every cell in that plant expressed this bacterial toxin. And, and you, well, you weren't on the Board of Pesticide Control, John, at that time, but when they registered this in 90, 1995 or 96, Monsanto was required to register that transgenic potato as a pesticide to be able to grow it in the state of Maine. And a tuber, uh, the reason they call a potato a tuber and not a root is because it's an extension of the stem. And if you leave a potato out in the light, it turns green, chlorophyll, uh, uh, development of you know, the poisonous compounds. It is part of that. Well, that transgenic BT, that is part of every cell of that plant, including the edible portion. Um, and there is concern that ingestion of uh, uh, the transgenic form of bacillus is not simply passing through uh, um, uh, the livestock gut or, or the human gut. But getting back to, uh, I guess I'm supposed to be talking about glyphosate here, but getting back to that, one guarantee, if you've got glyphosate resistant crop, you can guarantee that has been doused with glyphosate. And there is research from uh, Dr. Cirillini in France and his group, the Crygen Group, uh, research released in uh, September of 2012. Uh, there is research by Dr. Donald Huber, a uh, retired plant pathologist from Purdue University. And uh, these studies are, uh, this, the work that they are doing is indicating that the excessive use of glyphosate and if you look at the monoculture uh, cropping that we have, either continuous corn in the Midwest or corn, soybean, corn, soybean, now that you have transgenic Roundup resistant versions of both of those, mm -hmm. begun in 1996, on many acres in the Midwest, on tens of millions of acres, you have land that has been 15, 17 years continuous application of, of glyphosate. And Dr. Huber's work indicates that the uh, systems of livestock and human beings can assimilate and eliminate a certain level of glyphosate compound. Once you get over a certain threshold, there is this accumulation. And the way that glyphosate works, it is a chelator. It ties up essential minerals and it ki its killing actions, it, it allows a pathogenic fungi like fusarium or pythium, something in the soil to come in and kill that plant because it has stripped the immunity away from that plant. Well, if we're ingesting that, and if that becomes, as uh, Dr. Huber's research is indicating, becomes part of our um, body that we are starting to absorb that, that chelation can be taking important nutrients, uh, denying them from the body, and in his uh, uh, research, indicating problems with reproduction, not only in pigs, not only in cattle, but also in human beings. So that is the effect of glyphosate uh, and a glyphosate-centered uh, situation of agricultural addiction to, to that uh, very serious broad-spectrum key labor. Andre, benefits, costs, risks? Um, well, <laughs> one thing I wanted to mention, I don't know if everybody understands what uh, resistance is what Eric was mentioning. And basically, among all the weeds in the field, there would be some mutants which occur for whatever reasons. Maybe it was triggered by UV light, maybe it was a spontaneous mutation, whatever. So there could be mutants which are not susceptible to glyphosate for, again, whatever reason. Something 
outward over there. Usually those mutants do not do very well because uh, everything comes at a cost, including resistance. Example that I usually use in my classes, you know, throughout human history, there were always nerds among us. <laughs> and maybe present company excluded, but they were always around, okay? And all, they usually didn't do very well being pushed around and made fun of and so on. Until 1980s or so, you know, with information revolution, this kind of psychotype became sort of very well pre-adapted to, you know, doing information technologies. As a result, you know, as a joke, how do you call somebody whom you call the nerd at high school? Boss. Boss. <laughs> <laughs> so the same is with plants and glyphosate. You know, environment changed because of application of all those chemicals. So as a result, we have only resistant weeds surviving. And the same applies to insects and insect protected plants as well. So as a result, we have genetically engineered plants which are resistant to glyphosate. And then we have selected, I mean, it's not natural selection, it's like artificially selected weeds which are also resistant to glyphosate. So those two effects kind of cancel each other. And this is increasingly a problem. Now, on the benefit side, uh, I guess one benefit I can think of is that by using chemical control, um, you don't have to use mechanical control. So using soil conservation technologies such as like no teal corn, for example, it's easier for uh, resistant plants. Thank you. John? Would you like to... uh, I would, I'll, I'll tag on briefly uh, from a bit of what Jim was saying about, you know, I think to an extent the industry has gotten control of the genetics. And the one thing I'll say back in the day of hybrid corn, when you grow corn up here in what was uh, at what was at least the upper boundaries of corn production when I moved here you know it's really hard to show much difference between the benefit of hybrid corn and regular corn but at least when back in the day when you know when people were buying hybrid corn in in the Midwest that you know, when they were growing they were growing that in the Midwest they got a benefit I can take a lot of examples where um, research has been done and been conducted looking at these particular and, and, and this particularly leans to the BT corn but we did we conducted uh, seven site years so then multiple locations over a number of years of experiments where we took the same genetics with and without the trait the BT trait and we grew them uh, in fields across the state over a number of years in a number of environments and in the end we were able to show that where you have the trait we had fewer holes holes literally holes in the plant leaves or stalks or whatever but it did not translate to different yields it did not translate to um, a higher quality feed there was some thought that if insects were burrowing holes into the plants, it would allow fungi to get into the plant, which might make a, a cow go, you know, get sick from eating the feed. They call these, uh, uh, it's fusarium and some other different kinds of things that, would, that you might be concerned about. And we didn't even show that there was any difference in the quality of the corn silage. So when, I, when, when you ask me what's the cost and the, and the benefit or, or the risk of these, um, you know, I, I can certainly give you an example or two where there could be a benefit to a specific grower um, in a specific context. But overall, I think what we ultimately find is that the farmers might get a benefit from these technologies one year or two years out of, out of X number, maybe 10, but they're paying for that trait every single year. Every bag of corn they're buying, whether they need that trait in there or not, and farmers 
they you know they're going to go out and spend the money to grow a crop they want to grow they want to grow the crop and um, so they want to get the yield and so they have to pay for the trade whether they really want it or not the other thing about specifically about glyphosate and in that technology is that um, I like to use the expression that Mother Nature always bats last. And in any given in any given weed management methodology, if I go out with a cultivator and I cultivate the same way, um, you know, a plant's going to figure out how to do this. You know, those first dandelions you mow in your lawn in the summertime, you nail them when they when they're when the little flower tops are out there, and then pretty soon you find out that those little dandelions are putting their flowers down below the mower head, right? So they, 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 Mother Nature does bat last, and there are always going to be weeds that, that even a non-spectrum herbicide like glyphosate is not going to be particularly effective on. And guess what? Over time, those are the weeds you find in the cornfields. Those are the weeds you're finding in the soybean fields. And so when Jim says, yes, you have to start adding more product, you do. We needed, we needed to know these. We need to do the research to get this information to see what really happens out there. But we also ought to go back to our growers, and I do this on a really regular basis to say, you know, we haven't found glyphosate resistant weeds in this state as yet. And that's because well, I think, I'd like to think that's because we've gone out there and done a better job we talk to growers about, you know, if you need to control one specific weed and you know that weed is really well controlled with glyphosate, do it once and then go away from it for a while. And, and, and we've also tried to build in some other things along the way to um, try to better understand the risk to other growers that are not using it. I don't want to dominate the conversation, so but that, that's my cut on the risk and benefit of the Thank you. Um, the next next question is. Um, Can I pull up interrupt? Uh, question. Okay, thank you. And we we are. I'm sorry. If anybody has any cards, can I come around and collect? Sure. Yeah, Megan will collect uh, question cards, and um, we'll we'll get to uh, the uh, questions from the audience here shortly. Um, okay. My next question is. Uh, there are, there are many who uh, predict the global demand for food will double what it is today by the year 2050 due to population growth and the changes in the way people are eating and, and what we're formally uh, developing <coughs> nations. And um, so my, my next question is, do you think that um, uh, transgenic crops are a necessary technology and uh, will, play, will play an important role for feeding this uh, huge uh, demand for food that we're going to face in the next several decades. And uh, why don't we mix it up and start this, this time with, with John's end of the table. Um, I, it's a very good question. And I think my first take is that you know, we, are, we ought to be looking at a number of things. Strong family planning, education, education of, um, is, there's so many better ways to try to solve a population problem than trying to figure out a way to feed all of these other people that we're going to have on the planet. When I was born, there were three billion of us. Now there's 7.2 billion of us and you know, we're, we could go to nine, ten, who knows? And and the question is, is do we really have to? And I think the first thing we ought to be really trying to do our best on is to try to get out there and prevent the population from rising to that much. I was just in Tampa, and believe it or not, you know, academics are are the nerds that get pushed around, right? And and you know. They were, they were coming up with these grand solutions about growing vertically in glass houses in the city and growing food in outer space. And I'm just, I'm, all I could do is put my head in my hands and, sh and shake my head. I think we're going to do a lot better at working to farm in, as, in, as, in, a, in a safer, more conscientious soil building 
methodology, I think nine, I think time and time again, um, if what we do, what we do to build soil quality, what we do to um, change the way we eat, if we, you know, if, if the model is, you know, grow all these grains to feed all these animals to then feed all of us humans, that's a pretty inefficient system. We need to figure out a better food system so that we don't have to try to feed nine and a half billion people because in my mind, if we have to do that, we're, we're, we are really gonna be in the world of hurt. So I just don't think, I don't think transgenic crops are the solution to the problem. And I don't think more fertilizer is the solution to the problem. I don't know where those numbers are coming from. <coughs> Population uh, is, <coughs> there is, um, you know, people are stuck in 1960s because their professors keep re uh, you know, regurgitating the same Ehrlich's nonsense, which uh, has been proven over and over again incorrect. Population, uh, you know, fertility rates are collapsing all over the world not just in the so-called developed world, but also in the developing world. You know, in the US, it's in uh, around replacement rate right now. In uh, other industrialized nations, it's well below replacement rate. In developing nations like Brazil, or uh, uh, which used to have uh, real high ore in China, it's, bil it's around the below replacement rate. So we just have very few pockets in Sub-Saharan Africa and Central Asia where populations are still growing. As a matter of fact, it's probably about time to start talking about who is going to feed aging people, not how we control population growth. If you don't believe me, just check fertility rates. It's easily available from the, uh, it's easily available from the US government. So, I do not see the problem over there. Uh, what we do have, however, is the peak oil problem. You know, industrialization, including population, rapid population growth of the last 100 years, is based on extraction of fossil fuels. We cannot extract fossil fuels at an increasing rate. Looks like we cannot do it anymore. Things like fracking is scraping the bottom of the barrel. You can come up with a better scraper, but it's not going to change much. So we will be seeing considerable changes in uh, agriculture in the future. We will have to do that. In theory, genetically engineered plants can provide some relief. You know, we don't have to expand fossil fuels or uh, fossil materials, non-renewable resources on pesticides, fertilizers, and so on. The key is how do we use it? This current model is susceptible, uh, uh, sustainable? I don't think so. Can genetic engineering be used to increase susceptibility? Yes. I do so. Well, um, how convenient for Monsanto that the product that they have is going to save the world, and that if we just run to them, then there won't be any problems. It, you know, their marketing department works all the time. What I have read is that right now we could feed twice the population in the world that we have with current food resources. The problem is a problem of distribution, and hunger, hunger is a problem of poverty. It's not a problem of a lack of food. Additionally, uh, uh, at least one, I think there were two reports from the United Nations that showed that the, well, what we all know is the most food insecure inhabitants of this planet are those in developing countries, people that maybe make $300 a year. Uh, what these United Nations reports have shown is that by utilizing uh, the best concepts in organic farming, they can dramatically improve 
their productive capacity and they can eliminate that food insecurity where it exists now. This idea of first world countries like the United States growing the grain and then shipping it halfway around the world to those who can't feed themselves is an outmoded concept. What we need to do is to give them the tools so that they can develop their own ability to feed themselves. And of course, when there is natural disaster or weather problems, then it's our duty to come in and help them. But as a, uh, a structural system, they need to be given the tools to be able to grow their own food. And given their, uh, uh, they are perfectly suited to uh, taking the best of the organic uh, production methods that have been developed and refined in the last hundred years. And that is where they're going to be able to uh, grow healthy food for themselves and their own communities. And that's where we should be putting it. Where, where are these people that are earning $300 a year going to be able to buy seed from Monsanto? Since Monsanto has introduced their corn and soybean seed in the mid-90s, the price of seed has gone up 500%. You know, Monsanto is uh, a monopoly on certain crops like uh, soybeans, um, canola, and sugar beets. They control 90% of the market. The his, uh, the, the classic definition of a monopoly is when three or four companies control 40% of the market. If this was in banking, we, we'd be up in arms. So you have one agricultural company of major crops controlling 90%, and they are using that domination by uh, uh, to their gain by raising prices. So where are these third world uh, developing country uh, farmers going to have the money? to buy seed every year from Monsanto. It's a, it's a fool's idea. So, I mean, all really very good points, and I think maybe just to put a button on this thing, uh, the idea behind using transgenic crops to feed more people is, well, obviously the value-added uh, varieties where the yield of the crops is actually increased by trans genes. Um, Given that human population growth rates are actually slowing, uh, which is bonus, there's still a lot of mouths to feed. Um, there's an alternate tack that uh, folks who are proponents of, well, the GM companies, uh, say is that what we could do is engineer crops to grow on what's marginally arable land. So arable land is land that's good for growing crops on, right? Um, and the idea is that you would engineer crop plants to grow in land that, say, uh, closer to the coast, has more salt content in the soil, places where you don't normally grow crops, right? Uh, so we actually increase the area of land that we grow crops on, or we increase the yield of the crops that are grown on the land that we do grow them on currently. Um, all those give me some issue for concern, one that yields don't appear to be uh, increased in GM crops to the degree that would take care of feeding people if indeed the supposition is correct that that there's a lack of food to deal with people and I don't agree with that and my concern with engineering crops to grow on marginally arable land is that lands already occupied by plants and other organisms that live there in the first place and so we're intruding on their territory and we're very aware of the fact that Ecosystems are delicate balances, so it's, it's worth being wary of that. Um, in the big picture, really, if we structure, you know, our diet differently, um, it's been pointed out you can feed, um, you know, one human uh, or one human with the corn it would take to to feed one cow to feed a human, or you could feed ten humans with the corn that you would feed to the cow to feed the human. If we structure our diet differently, we can actually get more out of the food that we've got, and clearly there are issues with distributions of food. So I don't see where GM crops are really going to help deal with uh, increasing um, increasing human population or human population at the, at the size that it's currently at. Um, certainly agricultural practices that foster uh, or that really don't uh, wreck the soil that we have that allow us to continue to propagate crops uh, uh, throughout generations and the distribution of that food to people who need it I think is a probably a much better more sound approach with uh, less possible negative ramifications. Okay thank you Eric. Well we've got a lot of questions here from the audience and I 
I know that we're not going to be able to get to all of them, so I'll, I'll do my best to, to try to, to ask these. And uh, you all have the opportunity to uh, respond to any of them. Um, the first one I'm going to ask is, given all the recent studies on the bad effects of GMOs, isn't it more reasonable to ban GMOs rather than to merely label them? This is an audience question. So whoever feels... Uh, I can take a stab at it. Um, I think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to leapfrog past developed countries like Europe. Right now, uh, 64 countries in the world, representing over half of the world's population, have labeling of GMOs. The thought that we, and in the United States and in Canada, we don't have labeling of GMOs. Uh, uh, South Africa has labeling, China has labeling, Russia has labeling, Western Europe has labeling, Asia has labeling, the United States does not. I think that it's a significant first step uh, to get labeling. That allows for the first time for families to make a risk assessment. Um, it hasn't been brought out tonight, but the fact is the federal government does not do any testing of genetically engineered crops. The testing is done by the manufacturer that is introducing it. All the federal government does is a document review. Uh, in fact, there's a famous statement where the FDA is saying that the um, requirement on food safety is in Monsanto's hands. And then Monsanto says in another famous statement, our job is to sell as much of this as we can, determining the safety of this, that's the government's problem. Well, the fact is, the government does not do testing. Um, the fact is, because of American patent law, researchers are not permitted to do research unless they sign a licensing agreement with the corporation. And I have spoken to researchers who have read the licensing agreement offered to them by Monsanto, and they refuse to do the research because it allowed Monsanto to review and to de to review the results and to determine whether they would be released. And uh, any researcher with integrity would say that this is this is abhorrent to the idea of free and, and open flow of information. Um, so, uh, in essence, I think I think we've got a real uh, big problem but we've got to go at it by steps. So I think it's just unrealistic to think that we can leapfrog past the, um, uh, the Europeans and other uh, uh, countries uh, like the United States. Um, once we do have labeling, it will allow the market to finally work. And I think that was, you know, that's why um, I was um, uh, involved in this GMO label bill because I think that's what we're missing right now. There is no market mechanism at work because people don't know what is GMO and what is not. I personally believe that once people get that information, they will start to walk away from GMO products. You look at the labeling that's going on in Europe. As I understand it, if you go into a grocery store, you don't see many products that are labeled GMO because the manufacturers there understand the Europeans are not interested in genetically engineered food, including American manufacturers like Kellogg's. You go in and those cornflakes, they are sourcing non-GMO corn for making that cornflakes. So when they come and contribute uh, $22 million to defeat GMO labeling in Washington State last week, the I-522 initiative, saying this is going to cost so much for the labeling. Well, look at where there is labeling required. Uh, and then if you look at the cost of that cornflakes in Europe, the cornflakes that Kellogg sells in Europe that is non-GMO is less than the cornflakes in this country that are GMO and aren't labeled. So, uh, again, these are, what we're talking about is big ag and big food they don't want to give information to consumers. They simply want us to shut up and buy their product. And those days, maybe that worked in the 1950s. That don't work nowadays. We deserve that freedom, that transparency. It's a right to know. We have that right to know. Our families have that right to know. And once we get the right to know, I believe the market mechanism will show that the public does not want these GMO crops. That's what I think. Amen. Would you like to hear Well, I was one of those scientists who refused to sign a non-disclosure agreement because they would have shut me up you know, for years to come. 
Uh, I agree with Jim that I believe this is for consumers ultimately to decide whether they want GMO or not. Banning, for one thing, is uh, logistically difficult. What, what are you going to ban? Are you going to ban genetically engineered organisms at all? Are you going to ban any research on genetic engineering? Are you going to ban only certain types of genetically engineered organisms? Are you going to continue allowing, producing them, but not marketing them? Uh, secondly, I do believe that by banning, uh, you know, by banning genetic engineering, potentially we are throwing away a very, very valuable technology. The uh, environmental and health effects of genetically engineered organisms, even you know, um, even we can show them, which is not quite certain, although there were some studies, uh, some studies on health effects appearing, but I'm not terribly convinced. But uh, they are not comparable with the uh, known and proven environmental and health effects of internal combustion engine. I do not see much push to ban internal combustion engine or any research into those technologies. And this is, you know, this is a scientific fact that this stuff is bad for us. Okay, even being inside the car and breathing carbon monoxide over there as me and John were doing for two hours driving here. <laughs> it's not good. But are we going to ban internal combustion technologies? Probably not. So why treat genetic engineering separately? People who don't want to give them, they should have a choice not to eat them. People who don't like to drive, they don't have to drive. People who uh, don't like sugar, they should have a choice not to eat sugar. I could just add one other thing to it. I think there's also a place, I, I, I'm totally supportive of label, labeled things <coughs> because if you think about it, if you go to a market and you want to buy sweet corn, you know, and you, from the education side, the question is, what do you want in your sweet corn? Do you want sweet corn that is insect free? Do you want to pull out that tip and not see a bug there? Or is seeing a bug there okay with you? So if, if it's not okay with you, uh, then it's either been sprayed with a fairly intensive spray program, or it probably has its BT sweet corn. And so, you know, if you, or, or we got lucky that year and the, and, the, and the earworms didn't come up our way so far. But um, ultimately, if you know what you're buying, then, then there's an advantage. And you can say to yourself, I want organic sweet corn, and I don't mind a bug in it, and I'll buy my bushel of it, and I'll take it home, and I'll blanch it, and I'll cut it off, and I'll, I'll have sweet corn all winter. That's what I do, but that's what I choose to do. If I went to the market and had to choose between sprayed sweet corn and beet tea sweet corn, well, I'm, I'm gonna kind of tend to lean towards what Andre is saying. It's like, I, you know, pesticides, insecticides that are, that are sprayed on a real regular basis, it puts our growers at risk because they're having to spray them because that's what the public wants. If we could just get the public to realize that you know, there are alternatives and maybe a bug in the end of the, end of the corn ear is at the end of the world. Um, but at least by having the information that you want to say, you know, this is BT sweet corn, okay, I, I would choose that because I really don't want a bug in it. Or, you know, I don't want that because I'm uncertain about that, but I still don't want a bug in it. I'll take, I'll take the risk on eating the, the, the regular sprayed sweet corn, which, you know, they're following protocols and, and being, being to safe by people like EPA. So, um, but I think it's all comes down to education and choice. And I think that's a wonderful thing to have. We should have it. Yeah, the only other thing I wanted to throw out there was, you know, if you, like me, have friends and loved ones that depend on insulin for diabetes, 
then you're pro GM. That's how we make it. Put the genes that produce insulin into yeast and you cultivate it on in mass. The point I mean to make by that is that there's while there's some utility in genetic engineering and it hasn't yet fulfilled all its promises, what I really hope everybody takes away from this is that the genetic engineering, the, the methodology behind producing these is not the same as the issues that come up when they're mass produced, when they're owned by companies, when corporations have control over the, the generation and dissemination of these materials. <laughs> so my own personal opinion is the biggest part of the problem lies in not just in this venue, in many others in our country at this time, but with corporate entities and their compliance with what we consider to be a just manner of doing business. Um, that being said, that's just like I said, a point of clarification. There's some really good things that come out of this sort of technology. It's important, I think, to just keep in mind the technology and those who are using it are not exactly the same thing. Okay, thank you. Well, this one, I think John alluded to this question a little bit already, and it's a person, more of a personal level, because um, all these things are you know, kind of complex, and a lot of times you're faced with uh, not the ideal choices, and you're hungry, and you're looking for something to eat. So uh, do you knowingly eat uh, genetically modified products, or w and would you feed them to your children? And uh, I think that really kind of hits home. So whoever's <laughs> like to... It's kind of hard to say without the labeling going on. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is fairly safe, I assume, in the U.S. that if you have corn, if you eat corn or soybean products which are not labeled as organic or GMO-free, then you are eating genetically engineered organisms. So, uh, and yes, I eat them, and yes, I feed them to my children. Anyone else care to answer that? We're, we're, we're organic farmers, so a lot, a lot of what we eat, we grow ourselves. We grow, we grow corn. We grow uh, several varieties of sweet uh, corn, dry corn for seed, and for uh, for dry corn that's organic. Um, you know, we. We don't go into the grocery store that often. The food that we grow is better than we find in the grocery store. So, but you know, uh, we we and what we don't grow, we try to source organic. But you know, most of what we eat is organic food. It makes sense. We're also in using our dollars, um, supporting organic. We're su supporting other organic family farmers, and that's what we want our food dollars to to support. I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm more concerned about eating fast food than I am about eating GMOs when it comes down to it. But I agree that labeling allows consumers the ability to decide for themselves what they would like to do. Um, so in that light, I'd say, you know, uh, knowingly feed organic food to myself and my wife and my stepson, yeah, it's there. It's hard to get around it without labeling. You know, it's really hard to tell whether you are or you aren't. As Andre said, unless it's labeled otherwise. So at this time, with, in the absence of labeling, the only way you can have really avoid it if you so chose is to, to only eat foods that are labeled as organic, is that correct? Yes. As the one organic farmer on the panel, <clears throat> let, me, let me say, you know, this labeling thing, it's not going to help organic farmers. We're actually going to create another uh, subset within the market, and that's conventionally grown non-GMO. You know, we, we've already got the monopoly of non-GMO. What we want to do is to create the opportunity for, for the market to work. That, you know, this is supposed to be a capitalist society. It's supposed to be that people are informed and they can use their food dollars to make their decisions. It's, there's been a blackout of information that's not right. That, you know, transparency is a sign of a thriving democracy, and we don't have that, and that's why we're working to change it. Um, I guess that's all. Right, well, uh, the next question that I'm going to ask is, uh, 
what have studies shown with respect to the current state of bees in the genetically modified foods? And you know, I'd also be interested in knowing if there are other ins beneficial insects or insects that aren't harmful, at least, that might be uh, in potentially impacted. Uh, it's probably a question to me. Um, uh, regarding bees, we don't really know what's happening with them. Colony collapse disorder and pollinator decline, the current thinking is that it's an interaction of many different factors. A BT corn might be one of them. Other um, possibilities are insecticides, particularly neonicotinoid insecticides, which are absorbed by plants and found in nectar. There is a number of new diseases, and something that industrial migratory beekeepers don't like talking about, their practices are very unsustainable. You know, tracking around bees, feeding them with corn syrup, piling uh, hive upon hive upon hive while knowing that bees are territorial so they spend more time fighting with each other rather than foraging all those are not good practices is it conclusive that bt is a huge factor in it no could it be a, a contributing factor yes of course there was a highly publicized study on uh, impacts on monarch butterflies. The study itself was done in the lab. John Lowe's is a friend of mine. Uh, subsequent uh, field surveys did not show that much impact, but part of that was also insecticide sprays are not good for monarchs either. Right now we have a severe decline in monarchs this year could hardly see any of them. It's not probably due to BT, it's due to climate factors, uh, but it's certainly a concern. There were several studies showing possible concerns on aquatic, uh, on some aquatic uh, insects, in particular caddis flies, which are kind of sister order to moths and uh, butterflies, uh, which are uh, targeted by insect protected BT and, you know, leaf debris are being blown into strings and they can be exposed over there. Is it, it are we seeing any, like, total devastation of beneficial insects with, uh, BT plants? No. Do they have some impact? Yeah, I can definitely see that. Is this impact worse than uh, impact of conventional sprays? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we are I want to leave enough time for folks to complete the evaluation forms. It has, um, I, I hopefully folks pick them up on the way in. If not, um, Megan will um, pass them out. But uh, maybe folks can work on that while uh, we're addressing this uh, last question. And that would be, uh, could you give your views on how to preserve our heirloom crops in a world full of transgenic crops? <laughs> uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start here. I think um, it, it's very difficult to uh, keep the genie in, in the bottle. Um, if you look around, uh, it's, you know, the, the amount of cross-pollination that can happen in specific types of crops has made it very, very difficult to imagine that um, we can really keep things, you know, perfect. But on the, uh, on the other side of things, we, we, have, we have transgenes in 
the major crops, corn, soybeans, canola, uh, sugar beets, and, 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 and I think, I think we can, you know, most of the people saving or trying to grow and, and save and produce heirlooms are in hopefully other types of crop families. Um, and, and I think any efforts we can do to try to preserve that is, is all positive. I, I, I know that um, there is a, a huge seed bank, I think it's in Norway, up above the Arctic Circle, where they are preserving banks of seeds to ensure that there are these seed sources that will not be um, have been exposed to in any potential crossings, uh, which could be possibly useful down the road. So I, I think there is concern about that, um, and you know I, I, I think, but I think the reality is if you you know if you're out trying to find you know, GM-free can, canola seed, it's you know you might be able to, you can find it probably at, at European levels of GM-free seed, but but um, it's really hard to control when. A bee doesn't know the difference that goes and pollinates one mustard plant and flies over and gets in another one. So that's the hard part. We, we have some we have some good parameters and likely on how far say corn pollen can travel. And we did some work at at Maine looking at that. Um, but we don't have as good a handle on you know how far that pollen can remain by and maybe have some ideas on how far uh, Pollen can remain viable on the back of a bee that goes in and pollinates and transgenic and all of those and flies into somebody else's. So bees forage within several miles right here. Uh, and that pollen would remain viable oh, yeah. through that time. Oh, so yeah. there you can see why why it's why it's a very, very difficult topic to deal with. Would anyone else like to weigh in? Just we have a couple more minutes on, on that particular one? I'd, I'd weigh in. I mean, this is this is our bread and butter, uh, organic seed growers and trade. The reason we have gotten involved, the reason we have sued Monsanto, is that we recognize this is probably the greatest threat that the organic community has ever faced. Uh, in my opinion, the U.S. government let down the people by allowing these uh, genetically engineered crops to ever be registered. Uh, the transgenic um, flow, uh, genetic flow, it's unrecallable. It, simply, when a farmer follows instruction, contamination occurs. It's a faulty product. It should never have been allowed. Those genes go out. We have farmers within our association, within our plaintiff group, that have stopped growing organic canola, organic corn, organic soybeans, because of the certainty that they will be contaminated. And given the uh, legal situation, they are at legal jeopardy for being sued for patent infringement because of that. They've simply decided the risk of growing these crops is unsustainable. I could lose my farm because I would be contaminated. So we have an industry that has no desire to restrain its uh, uh, genetic pollution. We have a government that is indifferent. We had a, a case in the last few months where a farmer in Washington State purchased uh, alfalfa seed when it was not permitted to be genetically engineered, planted that, uh, so that was three years ago, harvested the alfalfa this year for export market and found it was GMO contaminated. And the USDA is doing nothing to help him. So in other words, the farmers that are injured, we're going to be left holding the bag. The multinationals like Monsanto, they're making their profit on it. They're not restraining the gene flow. The government is not doing anything. Um, and then, what happened to property, private property rights? Why is a farmer not secure on their own farm from trespass by these um, products that, you know, if, if you're a, a farmer exporting to Europe, and we, you know, uh, Monsanto is fond of saying that there's really been no demonstrated injury of the organic industry. Well, the fact is the organic canola industry in North America has collapsed. 
You know, we have friends, canola is a great rotation crop. It's totally dissimilar from uh, crops like wheat, corn, and soybeans, and it's a great rotation crop. It helps to clean up the soil. It was important for these organic farmers in their rotation, and they've had to give up that crop because the, the industry in North America has collapsed. And if that is not economic harm, you know, Monsanto, they, they sing this song, they tell, tell their version of reality, which no one else believes because it's, it's fictional. Uh, uh, they need to be respecting of uh, you know, institutions in, in this country like private property rights. They should not be allowed to have their pollution come onto our farms, contaminate our crop, uh, extinguish its value, and then get away. It, it's, it's not a fair system. That's why we've gone to court. And that's what I think we have to do. I think we have to aggressively use the laws in this country to protect farmers because the government is not offering that protection. So that's why we've gone to court. Well, thank all of you. It's been very informative. I know I've learned a lot tonight, and I hope the audience has as well. I'm sorry we weren't able to uh, answer, uh, address all the questions. Um, I hope some of you at, at least can make it next month on December 11th to uh, learn more about the um, Washington County food system. And please give our panel members a uh,